Hi everyone, I'm thrilled to host Michael Tannenbaum today. He's the visionary founder of Maverick IO and a trailblazer in talent acquisition. Michael's journey from head of recruiting at Dot Connect Digital to director of talent at Techno Solution paints a picture of innovation and success. Michael has scaled dozens of pre-IPO startups and has hired over hundreds of skilled technical candidates in his career. As he is very passionate about the recruiting ecosystem and helping organizations make excellent hires. Michael brings a unique blend of hands-on experience. Today, we are delving into the groundbreaking reverse recruiting model at maverick.io and gaining insights into Michael's wealth of knowledge on building and scaling startup teams. Join us as we uncover the secrets behind redefining recruitment and fostering a thriving startup culture with Michael. So Michael, over to you. Can you please provide a brief overview of Maverick's reverse recruiting model and the role of talent agents in helping candidates find opportunities in the tech industry? Yeah, no, of course. But thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So I'll get into it. So our company, Maverick.io, really what we focus on is creating a unique value proposition for candidates. You know, we're believers that candidates are not just a resume. They're not just a number. They're not just an applicant in an ATS system. Um, typically in how recruiting has worked is that it's been very client heavy and focused. What ends up happening is recruiting cr recruitment agencies work with these companies and they go through the process of trying to find a golden goose candidate, if you will, someone that is like top of the top. Um, but while that all happens, really recruitment companies in general, like they don't focus on the 20 to 30 best candidates. You can see they don't focus on the other ones that maybe don't get the job or maybe not as skilled. And they go through the process of just living in their ATS without getting really any attention or any love. Our focus is to really bring power back to the candidates. We're a company that we focus heavily on getting them jobs as soon as possible. And we also focus heavily on career development as well. So those are two things that are really important to us. We have what's called a talent agent in our team. Our talent agent connects with candidates. What ends up happening there is our talent agent is going out of their way to help them find jobs for this candidate and helping them improve in a career development sense as well. That's a really special part about it because oftentimes getting a job is a job itself. It takes a lot of time, especially now we're seeing in the marketplace where there's thousands of applicants per job. Candidates are feeling very discouraged and they're also feeling like, you know, why am I going to bother um, applying for this job, I might as well go outside, play the lottery. Maybe I'll have a little better chance, you know, of end up getting uh, some kind of career, some kind of job. So what we tell them is we connect you with someone that's going to go out of their way to curate your job search and making sure that we're utilizing AI tech and we're utilizing human-centered approaches to be able to go to market and connect them with the right hiring teams and offer them career development, resume optimization, interview training, and just really everything that's going to just make them like a really good candidate, because that's what we care about. We care about the general population, the people that want to get to that next level. Like we care about people that want to get from B to A. And that's what we really focus on in our, in our company. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now for early stage startups with limited resources, what strategies have you found effective in attracting top tier talent? And are there any unconventional methods or channels that you recommend exploring? Yeah, so in early stage startups, can't emphasize this enough, your first few hires are your most important. They're your most important because they're the backbone of your company, they're the backbone of your customer success, they're the backbone of your product development and how you're going to market with everything. Really, in that respect, the people that you're building around as your first few hires are going to really make or break a lot of the people that you hire after that. You know, and it's okay to, you know, first time around, you don't hire the best people. That happens. A lot of companies are still able to succeed afterwards around that. But it's it is important that you try to get it right as you're scaling and building a first time around. You don't you don't get a lot of second chances in business. That's 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 I would say an unfortunate truth. But one thing I would say is some strategies around that. You know, don't focus on the flashiest candidates. Don't focus on the candidates that coming from the Google or the Meta of the world that are making two, 300K. The truth is that we're not the same as far as company. You know, your company that is maybe a C stage or a series A is not the same as one of these Fortune 100 companies and can attract the same level of talent. There is a whole different ball game being played there. What you need to do 
is play your own ball game in that scenario. So what we encourage founders to do in early stage companies is really focus on the determination and the hustle of the candidate that you want to hire, making sure that there's someone that really just wants to get to work, wants to really put in put in the time and work well with you. You also want to hire somebody that um, aligns with your values as well. That's a very big one. And someone that, you know, they're able to learn quickly on the job. They might not be on paper the best candidate, but the whole point is if you can get someone that is very adaptable and willing to learn, I think that's worth its weight in gold. Um, another piece of advice I do give startup founders is, to be honest with you, really emphasize on your training and development. Training development is huge. Every time I hire for my team, one thing I will always do is make sure I'm training them myself. I'm working with them diligently within the first two to three weeks just to be like, okay, we're going to get to this point, to this point. And then we track from there how they progress. Now, obviously, this is a little tougher at a high level. Some startup founders don't have the bandwidth to really train other employees. But what you can do is create a process around training and development. You can create a protocol where the person who is doing the training, you can have them follow up a, a simple method of how they're doing it. So what we're wanting to do is bring B players to A players in that training and development. That's like our most important thing. So if we're training and developing really well, if we're not just focusing on the most expensive, most high-end talent, that's super important because the truth is this, there's something called opportunity cost. If you spend, let's say six months looking for this candidate and you know you end up hiring the candidate or you don't hire the candidate, it doesn't really matter at that point. You spend six months doing it. Your other competitor company, what are they doing? They're scaling products. They're getting new customers or winning new business that you could have won. They're doing a lot of things in the background while you were very fixated on hiring this one person. And you know, just in the same way, startup founders always say, I fire quickly. Well, do you hire quickly? Do you, do you are, are you able to understand that there is an intrinsic value in not just being fixated on the best person in the market, but also just trying to go out of your way to hire somebody that is going to work towards getting to that point. I always believe in giving people chances. And um, those are the top three things I would say are most important for startup founders. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, Maverick has built a strong presence in the recruitment space. So can you share specific steps or initiatives Maverick took to establish and strengthen its employer brand, especially in the early days? So any lessons learned that might be valuable for startup founders? Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of employer brands and just strategies around that, you want to be able to res have your own mission that you stick to. And you want to have the demographic that really aligns there. So the most important thing is like, know your audience, you know? For our audience, we target mid-level um, to senior professionals in their career that are having a tough time getting that next job or having a tough time in their career finding alignment. They might feel like they're in a career switch or they might feel like they're in a position where, you know, like they're just having a hard time in this tech space to get recognized. Um, I'd spoken to so many good candidates recently that are like, I feel like nobody's paying attention to me. I feel like I'm the person at the party nobody's dancing with. And <laughs> the truth is that like, you know, sometimes all you need is that additional help. Um, so when we talk to companies and in general, startup founders and branding, it's really important that you narrow down your demographic, you narrow down exactly who you're trying to reach. And then from there, you have a really targeted outreach, how you're going about it. And that's social media that is paid social, that obviously is on LinkedIn. I think if you're able to build a really immersive brand on LinkedIn, that's going to help you tremendously. What I encourage people to do is live streams on LinkedIn as a way for you know, you to share your brands, have someone mediate the conversation, have someone ask questions about your company. So candidates are going to say, you know what, you're not just a job on the wall, like you're a person, you're, you got values. I'd love to join your company. And that's the kind of like reaction that candidates see when they really see that you care very heavily. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now talking about remote work. So how has Maverick adjusted its hiring and team building processes as remote work is becoming more and more prevalent? And are there any specific tools or practices that have proven effective in maintaining a connected and productive remote work culture? Yeah. So with remote work, obviously, like 10 years ago, it started to ramp up very heavily. We had during COVID, what ended up happening is it really accelerated from there. And now we went through this kind of like this battle in the middle where we're like, we want you back in the office or no, we want remote work. 
I think remote work is an excellent way to go through the process and modify your background. Because, you know, think of it like this. I'll share a bit of a story. When I first got into the professional work setting, I worked in Manhattan at a college. I lived in a town called the Rockaway uh, out in Queens. I would have to take a train three hours every single day altogether to get to my job. And sometimes I would stay later. Sometimes I would like put in the extra hour, say to 7 p.m. some nights when I was working. So I would only, I would get home at 11 p.m. at night some days. The truth is that there's a lot of time spent in traveling for a lot of these candidates. For me, it was three hours. So let's think about this for a second. Like altogether, it's been three hours a day traveling. That is 15 hours a week. And that's 60 hours in a month. That's 60 hours. You know, that's a full work week and then some that candidates are spending traveling. And I think as founders, it's okay to understand that like, you know, like we, we have to be able to manage our time effectively. And once you give people the power to work from home and being able to leverage that, being able to give them autonomy and scalability around that, they're able to put much more hours into your business. They're able to take much more time to do it. That's from my unique case, I was, you know, I had to work in Manhattan because that was like the Mecca of all the work. I couldn't work anywhere else in my industry. It had to be Manhattan. For a lot of people, it's it had to be before San Francisco. It had to be New York. It had to be Dallas. It had to be all these places. But now it's dispersed and people, you're getting a lot more talent in other areas right now. So I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, there's a few, obviously, pointers around that. Most important thing, number one, is you want to make sure you're creating a culture of transparency that has some layer of, level, uh, layer of KPIs there as well. Obviously not trying to be a micromanager in that scenario, but KPIs just at the end of every week give you a wrap up of what's going on within your job, what progress was made, what updates are made. There needs to be transparency in that scenario. And it's super important as you scale and build your company that you're creating this culture around transparency. People can openly share updates and openly share progress because having a remote team you know, if you hire outside the country or out, or in, within the country, those metrics are really vital to seeing how people are doing and if you have to have a tough conversation or not. Thank you so much. So startups often have a unique culture. And how does Maverick assess culture fit during hiring, especially for startup environments? And are there any specific traits or experiences you prioritize when evaluating candidates for compatibility with the startup's culture? Yeah, I think... The thing to kind of admire is that every company is different and you really want to understand like the why behind exactly like why every company does what they do, like their mission statement, for example, a candidate has something similar. There's always a why behind like the work they want to do, what they're trying to build, what they're trying to scale. And as a founder, when you hire, you want to be able to interview these people and go through the process of really understanding, you know, what that why is like, does this person align value wise with my business? And overall, it's super important as you continue to scale and grow um, your team that you're really assessing like if they're getting along well with members of your team, how that's going. If you're noticing in a dev environment, for example, there's something called pair programming. So pair programming is really huge. It's something that like you want devs to work with other devs really well. They're able to ship products a lot quicker and a lot faster. They can troubleshoot things a lot quicker in that scenario. And that's really important in your culture as far as uh, you go through the process of doing that as well. So I always tell people like, make sure like, if you're looking to build out a really good culture, don't just hire a lone wolf dev, for example, don't hire somebody that is going to just code all day and not answer your emails or answer your texts. You know, you want to hire people that are corresponding with your team, promoting positive energy throughout your organization. And that is something that is like, I think paramount is the vibe and the energy around your company and what that's bringing and what that's doing. Momentum builds momentum. And if you can get that culture, that's going to someone that's going to bring that positive energy to your business and it's going to go throughout it, it is going to, I guess, have a domino effect, if you will, in that scenario. Thanks, Michael. Now, Maverick utilizes AI technology to streamline the recruitment process. So for startups looking to adopt similar technologies, what key considerations should they keep in mind? And how can technology seamlessly integrate into the hiring workflow without overwhelming the team? Yeah, so... It's really interesting. So like our AI tech, it's really designated to really reach hiring teams directly. So we work with a candidate. The idea is that the talent agent partners with them, like, okay, I'm going to do my best to get you a job in the next one to three months time. How do we do that? 
our approach is we have AI tech that's able to scrap emails and be able to reach out to hiring teams directly. It alleviates the process of our team to really go through like the mundane, like emails one at a time, but they can easily reach people in a much more efficient manner. What we do is we offer human centered approaches. So not everybody just wants to speak to an AI all the time. They don't want to speak to a, you know, they want to speak to a person. So within our company, that's what we offer. We offer human to human connection, and we're improving our efficiency by using AI to get in touch with our companies. In terms of how other companies can leverage it, you know, there's a few things to keep in mind before you start incorporating AI into your business. Number one is look at your future roadmap, see exactly if it's going to play into a pivotal role in your business. Um, don't just implement something for the sake of implementing it without understanding, you know, what's going on. This is where the whole chess idea of business comes into play because you have to be like a grandmaster in chess, a lot of steps ahead of the game. They understand everything that's going on. You don't want to implement something that is short term, whereas it's affecting your customer engagement, where it's affecting your customer success, where it's affecting your team's, even like their motivations to do work as well. So before you implement any technology, you have to see how is it going to impact my team? First thing. Second thing is you want to see like, how is it going to save time? So we implement note-taking AI into our process. We implement ChatGPT at times into our process. You want to see how is this going to really mediate and save time and really not dilute from value at all. So if you can get AI technology that can save you time and not dilute the value of what you're doing, not dilute the quality, that's a win-win. You honestly want to try to incorporate that. Um, there's a lot of tools out there. I know Apollo, there's Jasper. I know Otter, ChatGPT. People are creating new chatbots for ChatGPT. They're creating different programs within it, which I think are really cool. You can set up automations through Zapier as well. That allows you to kind of like use ChatGPT as an interface to get in touch with customers. All really good stuff. But the most important thing is you need to make sure that your end customer on the other end is not getting a lesser experience as a result of the AI that's being created. Thank you so much. Now, given the rapidly evolving nature of the job market, how does Maverick stay informed about and adapt to emerging hiring and talent acquisition trends? And are there any specific tools, platforms, or sources of information that startup founders can leverage to stay ahead of the curve? Yeah, so we have a pretty unique privilege. Our business model, um, we work with a lot of different recruitment agencies that are all plugged into our business. So our goal, not only using our AI to get candidates jobs, what we are also doing is, you know, partnering with other recruitment agencies. We're saying, look, like we have a great candidate for you. We want to give you them free of charge. We want to give you this candidate. And that's something that recruitment agencies are plugging into our business right now. And they're saying, okay, we'd love to interview candidates and get them set up, you know? So with all that said, we're able to get information on the job market, everything that's going on with it. We work with some portfolio companies. We're able to understand exactly what's going on in the space right now. And um, in general, you want to be in the know. I think there's a few different tools you can leverage in the marketplace as a company. Crunchbase is an excellent tool. I would use Google Google Analytics and Google Search Trends. I know we're kind of talking about the AI bit a bit. You know, this time last year, I believe AI was taking off. Everybody was searching it, like, what's AI? How can this work for my business? All these things. A lot of people, a lot of businesses capitalized on that original search and they're able to build out really strong AI businesses across it. Whereas there's some businesses now that are just like, okay, we want to start using it. How do we get started? You know, you're kind of late to the party in that scenario where like a lot of companies already started because they took advantage of the market research that was being provided and they're being nimble in that regard. So you want to like leverage what new developments are happening in the marketplace. Google analytics is huge. I know LinkedIn speaking to a lot of candidates. I get to see like what companies are having layoffs, but it's truthful that there's a lot of lists out there, a lot of Slack communities that you can join and you can see what's happening on around you from business level. And you always want to be informed because that's going to be really important for your business strategy as you go forward in the process. And obviously it's something that I think most founders, they always say, I don't have time to do these things. That's always like a non-negotiable is like make time to read every single day. Take like 15 minutes. They got these apps nowadays where you could like get like very quick snapshots into the news of what's going on. So always encourage founders to go through their process and like understand what research is coming in and what's what's out there. Thank you so much, Michael. That was very insightful. So any final word of advice that you have for founders, anything that you would like to share to wrap it up? Yeah, I think 
the most important advice I can give founders and startup companies is be yourself, be your own company. Don't try to be a carbon copy of another company. Don't try to be Meta, Meta's, Google's, Microsoft's of the world, or like companies that have already done what maybe you think you have done at all and try to like copy their entire business plan and process. Ultimately that, that stuff doesn't really work well. Maybe in the short term, it can, you can do a little well, but it doesn't do anything for you in the long term. Um, our business, we're predicated on the idea that like every candidate has intrinsic value and we're, we want to bring power back to the candidate. We're not every other recruitment agency that just wants to focus on the clients and the end client and finding that one very special candidate. We want to work with a variety of candidates and handle understanding like what's going on in their lives and obviously trying to get them employed and working. And that's a big thing for us on a reverse recruiting lens, you know, but I think it's really important that you just understand your business, understanding the unique value proposition of how you're going to market. Because every business is going to be different. You're going to have examples where like companies are going to provide unique value in the market and they're going to want to obviously see what's out there. But overall, companies are really byproducts of that success, like how unique they can be, how well they can innovate, how well they can work with their consumers. And that's a big one. Like I always like to say the money ball. Have you ever seen the movie? It is basically the Oakland days of a team that didn't have a lot of money. They're able to scrap and get their way to getting wins. And as a founder, your most important two goals are revenue and team building. And how are you going to get to that point? It's not always the road most traveled. Sometimes it's the road less traveled. Like, what are you going to do to be scrappy and be lean and really get to that point where you need to go? And sometimes it involves being creative in your solution and your business. So that's my honest um, advice is be yourself and don't be afraid to go against the grain. Thanks so much, Michael. I'm really glad for your candid answers and uh, also being so generous and gracious with your time today. Yeah. I am an MBA student at Fordham and I know like, you know, every year so many students like come out and then they're looking for jobs, uh, highly potential, you know, individuals looking uh, for a right opportunity. I'm sure we'll be very glad to work with you and also the founders who are trying to navigate the whole recruiting system. So I'm really glad and happy for what you do. And uh, I hope you had a good time uh, with this interview today. Yeah, yeah no, it was great chatting with you. And uh, we're in positions where we're really hoping to helping anybody. You know, we work with a lot of college grads and work with a lot of mid-level professionals as well. But, you know, it was great chatting with you and um, have a great rest of your new year. Thank you so much.